Welcome to the Temple of Babylon podcast. It is Monday, 14th of December, 2020, and this is your host, Oliver St. John. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Series 2, Episode 6. We open with a reading and comment on Thunder Perfect Mind, The Gnostic scripture has proved baffling to scholars, yet the enigmatic text resonates with the voice of Babylon, as heard through the ages. We present here a new translation of the text that may inspire those sensitive to the call of Isis. Part 2 resumes with Love is the Law of the Scarlet Woman, an in-depth look at magical polarity. The episode concludes with the Scarlet Woman or Soul in the Underworld. The Egyptian Ka, with all its desires and appetites, strongly moved by lunar magnetism, is the Scarlet Woman or Soul in the Underworld. She must overcome the hostile forces of the Underworld if she is to survive physical mortality. Series 2, Episode 6, Part 1 The Gnostic scripture, Thunder Perfect Mind, has proved baffling to scholars. It is comparable in some ways to the voice of Nuit in chapter 1 of the Egyptian Book of the Law and the Sophia Barbello that has appeared to Thelemic devotees in more recent times. Thunder Perfect Mind forms part of the Nag Hammadi Library, The only surviving Coptic manuscript is kept at the Coptic Museum, Cairo. The original is thought to have been written in Greek. The date is unknown, but is reckoned to be from approximately 2nd to 3rd century Alexandria in northern Egypt. The Creatrix has a primal role in the ancient mysteries, namely the pre-religious mysteries, which are inclusive of the sacred feminine. Babylon is the daughter of Nuit, and the Scarlet Woman her soul. The fragments of Gnostic scriptures that survived the book burners more than two millennia ago are heavily tainted with what was then the growing suppression of all magical practices. The scriptures such as Pistis Sophia and the Trimorphic Protonoia carry powerful elements of the Gnosis, but such texts were already being redacted and overwritten under the influence of fanatical ascetic cults. Such cults, no less than the religions that formed out of them, can only construe the sacred in a male image, or otherwise as an abstract father whose ministers obediently spout nationalistic, militarist propaganda. The ferocious condemnation of all foreign gods and their pagan worshippers in the books of the Old Testament, the horrible threats and curses against anyone, especially women, practising magic, divination, or even dancing, roll on, foaming at the mouth for page upon page. The emergent state monotheism of 600 to 500 BC threw out the priestesses from the temples while systematically eliminating all the rights of women. They were thereby forced to become wholly subservient to men through laws that were to be enforced with the utmost cruelty. The biblical Book of Numbers, 30, 1-16, for merely one case example, is a catalogue of hateful, damaging laws. 
the traditional lesser ritual of the pentagram, as given in Crowley's Liber O, and various Golden Dawn-derived material, requires us to invoke the biblical demiurge Tetragrammaton in the East. This is the same demiurge that, according to Scripture, demands that worshippers of any other gods but the supreme god of the patriarchs should be utterly destroyed. The latter phrase occurs no fewer than 21 times in the King James Bible, commencing with the book of Exodus 22.20. Given that the worshippers of foreign gods, so-called, are supposedly impure, it seems somewhat ironic that in the next verse of Scripture, the jealous God Tetchily demands the timely submission of first-born human sons as sacrifices on his altars. Later, animal sacrifices were substituted for the human ones, a practice that necessitated wholesale slaughter at various times of the year. Egyptian and Babylonian deities, along with all magical arts and divination, are furiously condemned in the righteous scriptures of the monotheistic God. The work of Kabbalists in the Western mystery tradition, however well-intentioned, has tended to gloss over this by positing that Tetragrammaton is merely an elemental formula, or that the insertion of an additional letter Shin puts it all to rights by asserting a Christian theological notion of redemption based on sin, guilt and debt. The rise of asceticism, anthropocentric religions and scientism coincided historically with the suppression of women under the absolute rule of patriarchal governance. Since that time, nature has herself been viewed as an adversary. As a consequence, we are now witnessing the wholesale destruction of our natural environment. The distortion of the Sumerian creation myth, where Eve, instead of being blessed, is cursed for all of time for giving Adam the fruits of knowledge to eat, is continued in modern times. The world has changed again, and very quickly, since we completed the writing of Babylon Unveiled towards the end of 2018. Indeed, it has changed since we did the last podcast, number five. The repression of the Gnosis by exoteric world religions was well noted in Babylon Unveiled and was necessary in the context of the book. It must be said, though, particularly in view of these recent events, that religion, especially Christianity, is an easy target. In fact, Christianity has been the subject of a prolonged and vigorous attack in recent years for political reasons, and on entirely fallacious grounds. Speaking from the point of view of the present times, a mere nine months after the most abrupt change to world politics in history, one might say that religions have lost all power in the world today and have become uprooted from the traditions that kept them alive. We should not rejoice in this defeat in the face of what is going on now. The evil that was perpetrated in the name of religion long, long ago to control and dominate human lives is being done all over again, only this time in the name of science. The global success of the latest campaign owes in many ways to the fact that its means are completely unprecedented. Yet there are historical antecedents. From the 15th century and onward, following publication of Malleus Maleficarum, The Hammer of the Witches, most people believed in witchcraft, and that witchcraft was responsible for spreading sickness and death. The printed book was then the latest technology. The book, the written word, was held as sacred. Belief in it was beyond question. The only book most people had seen was the Bible. The printing press was soon put to use to disseminate lies and propaganda. Then, as now... 
scientific evidence, so-called, was produced to support the fictional but compelling narrative. Then, as now, dissenters wisely kept silence rather than antagonise the mob. Thunder Perfect Mind was received in oracular fashion. Some of it may have been delivered in response to questions asked by those assembled to hear it. More than one scribe may have recorded the oracle accounting for some overlapping in the source text, as though different versions were superimposed. There follows here a reading of our new contextual translation of the sacred text. I was sent forth from mystery, and I will come to them that reflect upon me, for those that seek me shall find me. Behold me, ye who reflect upon me, and listen to me, ye that have ears to hear. Ye who have waited for me, take me to yourselves, and do not banish me from your sight. Do not say hateful things of me, do not hear them spoken. Do not be ignorant of me anywhere or at any time. Be vigilant, do not forget me. I am the first and the last. I am the blessed one and the forsaken one. I am the whore and the holy one. I am the wife and the virgin. I am the mother and the daughter. I am the members of my mother. I am the barren one, and yet many are her sons. I am she whose wedding is of great nobility, and I have not taken a husband. I am the bride and the bridegroom, and it is my husband who begot me. I am the mother of my father, and the sister of my husband, and yet he is my offspring, and from him I take my power. I am the rod of his power in his youth, and he is the staff of my old age. I am the silence beyond knowing, and the idea of continuous recollection. I am the voice whose tongues are legion, and the word whose forms are many. I am the oracle whose utterance is my name. You who deny me, confess me, and you who confess me, deny me. You who tell the truth about me, lie about me, and you who have lied about me, tell the truth about me. You who know me, do not know me, and those who have not known me, let them know me, for I am knowledge and ignorance. I am shame and I am pride. I am shameless and I am ashamed. I am strength and I am fear. I am war and I am peace. Take heed of me. For I am the one who is disgraced, and the one who is exalted greatly. I am Isis, the one whose image is great in Egypt, and the one who has no image among the barbarians. I am the one who has been hated everywhere, and who has been loved everywhere. I am the one whom they call life, and that you have called death. I am the one whom they call law, and that you have called lawlessness. I am the one whom you have pursued, and I am the one whom you have seized. I am the one whom you have scattered, 
even while ye have gathered me together. I am the one before whom you were ashamed, and you have been shameless unto me. I am the one whom you have despised, and yet you reflect upon me. I am the one you have hidden from, and thus do you appear to me. And wherever you hide yourselves, I myself will appear. And whenever you appear, I myself will hide from you. You that would know me will yet darken my understanding and embrace my wisdom with sorrow. You embrace me in places that are ugly and ruined and steal from those which are true even in your falsehood. Out of shame, take me to yourselves shamelessly and when you find fault in my members, Look for that fault in yourselves. Come forward to me, you who know me, and you who know my members. Then you will establish the great ones among the smallest of creatures. Why do you curse me and pretend to honour me? When you were wounded, I gave you mercy. Do not separate me from those who once knew you, and do not cast anyone out, nor turn anyone away. I am the mind of thunderous perfection. I am the answer to my own question, and the knowledge of those who seek after me, and the will of those who ask of me. I am the power of the powers in my knowledge of the angels who have been sent at my word and of gods in their seasons by my counsel and of the spirits of every man who dwells with me and of the women who dwell within me. I am the one who is blessed and who is praised and yet who is scornfully despised. I am peace, and war has come because of me. I am an alien and a citizen. I am the substance and the one who has no substance. There are those who cannot know me from their ignorance, and those who know me that are of my very substance. Yet those who are close to me have yet been ignorant of me, and those who are far away from me have yet known me a little. On the day when I am close to you, you are far away from me, and on the day when I am far away from you, I am closer to you than I can ever be. I am forever within. I am always of the qualities, I am forever of the principalities and the spirits, I am always that which the soul seeks, I am control and that which is uncontrollable, I am unity and dissolution, I am the one that is below and yet they come up to me, I am judgment and acquittal. I, I am sinless, and the root of sin derives from me. I am the weak lust in the appearance of things, and the strong will to the eternal is within me. I am the sound that may be heard by everyone, and the voice that is beyond reason. I am a mute who does not speak forth, and yet great is the multitude of my words. I prepare the bread, and my mind is within it. I am the knowledge of my own name. I am the one who cries out and who hears. 
I appear, and yet I walk in the shadow of invisibility. I am the attacked and the defended. I am the one who is called truth and who is known to be iniquitous. For what is within you is what is outside of you, and the one who fashions you on the outside is the one who shaped the inside of you. And what you see outside of you, you will see inside of you. It is visible, and it is your garment. Hear me, O ye that have ears to hear, and learn of my words, ye who know me. I am the sound that is attainable by all, I am the voice beyond reason. I am the name of the sound, and the sound of the name. I am the signature of the letter, and the seal of the division. I am the darkness and the light. And I am the voice of my listeners, and the one who listens to you. For I am the great power, and he that sends forth to me will hear my name. And he that delivers me shall be as one who created me, and I will speak forth his name. Take heed, then, ye that hear me, and ye angels also, and those who have been sent, and ye spirits who have arisen from the dead. For I am the one who alone exists, and I have no one who will judge me. Many are the pleasant forms that exist in numerous sins and poisons, even in disgraceful passions and fleeting pleasures, which men embrace weakly. When they seek and attain clarity and go up to their place of peace, then at last shall they find me and they shall have life, and they will not die again. After a short break, we will resume the reading from Babylon Unveiled Thelemic Monographs with Love is the Law of the Scarlet Woman. Series 2, Episode 6, Love is the Law of the Scarlet Woman. The Gnostic term syzygy refers to male-female pairings of the emanations or aeons. The aeons are best thought of here as abodes for types of consciousness, as opposed to periods of time measured from the terrestrial sphere. An aeon may refer to an eternity or a world. It was also anciently used as a title for a person that had become a master of the Gnosis. In the Egyptian Book of the Law, Liber L. 1.15, the aspirant is instructed that all power is to be given to the Scarlet Woman. Now ye shall know that the chosen priest and apostle of infinite space is the prince-priest, the beast, and in his woman called the scarlet woman is all power given. They shall gather my children into their fold. They shall bring the glory of the stars into the hearts of men. Polarity magic was at the core of Dion Fortune's work. 
As a self-declared moon priestess, Dion Fortune required solar priests to work with. The fraternity of inner light developed the magic of polarity while Dion Fortune was the director of studies. Such practices were not continued in the order by her successors. However, the part played by magical polarity is vital. C.R.F. Seymour, a member of the Fraternity of the Inner Light, while Dion Fortune was still in charge of operations, adapted the term syzygy as descriptive of a mode of theurgic practice. In a diary record, he wrote, I knew that, as an initiate of the serpent wisdom, I had to share this power with my syzygy. And turning to the priestly adept who gave me this initiation, I saw that he, as an adept, was his own syzygy. He had polarized the higher and lower natures, and so was a complete self-polarizing entity. Extracts from the November 1940 diary record of polarity work are reproduced in Dances to the Gods, Alan Richardson, Aquarian Press, 1985. Polarity magic works through direct personal contact. It is also effective at a distance through magical practice and correspondence. The inner working of polarity does not necessarily involve any other human person. Initiatic transmission has its origin beyond the human sphere. Anything else is not truly initiation. Historically, initiatic organisations did not function in the way that people now imagine. The work was facilitated through correspondence between the adept or transmitter of the current and the aspirants, usually a small group of people. The initiatic tradition goes back thousands of years. The task of every hermeticist is to study philosophy and cosmology. From that they form a great symbol of the universe – a Sri Yantra, which is built into their astrosome and then activated for theurgic work. When an adept develops this and creates a unique symbol of the universe, they begin to teach others. In teaching others, that symbol becomes perfected. Having said that, the original or new work must have its basis in existing tradition and in initiatic transmission. It cannot be merely the invention of an individual. Polarity is vital. Without it, there is no great work. Magical polarity takes place not only from person to person, but also from inner plane contacts to those living on earth. The law of Thelema, as written and concealed in the Book of the Law, is a law of relationship, of love under will. The polarity between the aspirant and the holy guardian angel is vertical. In the ordinary case, human relationships are horizontal on the same plane. When magical polarity is properly managed, either one, both or all practitioners establish a degree of vertical polarity. They have thus forged a link with the inner planes, which it is ever the object of magic to establish. When no such links are forged, the polar magnetism is locked into the human personalities, with all the usual schismatic consequences of ambition, rivalry, jealousy, and abuse of power and privilege. When inner plane contacts are established, polarity magic brings a great deal of energy, force, or magnetism into a ritual or a daily practice. The power that is raised is carefully directed according to the nature of the magical operation. Passive vampirism, on the other hand, occurs when a person is ignorant of the occult principles. The innate vampire seeks vitality from others instead of acquiring it from the free elemental resources of nature and the vertical polarity of inner plane contacts. An analogy with atomic bonding in physics can be made with this lending and borrowing principle inherent in the universe. There is a grave danger when the appetite of the car 
the vital body, becomes dissociated from the intellectual and moral faculties. You may wish to study this further in my book, The Law of Thelema Quantum Yoga, the chapter entitled Leviathan and the Beast. Nuit and Hadit express the ultimate cosmic principle of polarity manifested on the earth as female and male, moon and sun, night and day, darkness and light. On the magical plane, Nuit and Hadit are expressed as the Ku and the Kaps. This pair is the magical body and star that manifests through the mysterious alignments or space marks. According to the wisdom of Aiguas, Liber L, 1, 8 to 9, the Kaps is in the Ku, not the Ku in the Kaps. Worship then the Kaps, and behold my light shed over you. Chapter 1 of the book is concerned with the nature of Nuit, absolute space, containing infinite possibilities. The light of Nuit is shed over those who worship her star. Nuit is able to appear as magnetic emanation, the circumference of the circle. It is Hadit, the esoteric will that causes her manifestation as a body of stars. Yet Hadith only exists through virtue of Nuit's circle. Nuit's ultimate revelation is her nakedness, for, as the principle of containment itself, the circle of zero, how can she be contained? Thus Nuit is never depicted as clothed. Only by the magic of Hadith, who is at once the magician and the exorcist, can Nuit manifest. While Nuit can thereby be known, Hadith can never be known, as declared in Liber L 2-3-4. In the sphere I am everywhere the centre, as she the circumference is nowhere found, yet she shall be known, and I never. The knower, the principle of consciousness itself, can never be known. Nuit is able to appear by virtue of her stars, her children or followers, the Egyptian Shemsu. Herein is the romance and mystery of life, death, love and eternity. The polarity magic of Nuit and Hadith is a dance, a love play or lila, that, through its motive effect upon space, whirls the worlds into life, so eternity is reflected in the continuity of existence. A polarity magic, once seen in this way, can hardly be ignored or disposed of as a mere detail of the hermetic tradition or as an experiment that began and ended with Dion Fortune in the 1930s and 40s. A polarity is how the magic works, whether it is seen to be about the creation of worlds or their destruction. The starry body of Nuit is her appearance, but hidden among the stars is the key of eternity's doorway. Liber L tells of the soul's redemption, not as a covenant between a god resembling a tax collector and his chosen race or religion, but through seeking out Nuit's love by following the path of knowledge and wisdom. The true covenant, which is no pact of blood, is declared in Liber L 1.32. Obey, my prophet, follow out the ordeals of my knowledge, seek me only, then the joys of my love will redeem ye from all pain. This is so. I swear it by the vault of my body, by my sacred heart and tongue, by all I can give, by all I desire of ye all. Series 2, Episode 6 The Scarlet Woman or Soul in the Underworld 
We mythologize that which we know to be true, yet cannot explain rationally. Since Plato, at least, reason has been placed above myth in our culture. The word myth is derived from the Greek mu, meaning from the mouth. To the materialist, this can only mean speech, a story or tale, something less than the rational exoteric explanation. The following quotation is from The Problem of Pain, C.S. Lewis. There have been times when I think we do not desire heaven. But more often I find myself wondering whether, in our heart of hearts, we have ever desired anything else. You may have noticed that the books you really love are bound together by a secret thread. Again, you have stood before some landscape which seems to embody what you have been looking for all your life and then turned to the friend at your side who appears to be seeing what you saw. But at the first words, a gulf yawns between you and you realize that this landscape means something totally different to him, that he is pursuing an alien vision and cares nothing for the ineffable suggestion by which you are transported. Esoterically, the myth is a vehicle for the non-verbal utterance, silently conveying the secret buried deep in the heart of all things. Thus, muo means silent, a secret, and to close the mouth. To reveal an occult secret is to conceal it, for by declaring it in speech or writing, the myth is inevitably retold. Magic and myth are inseparable and are equally hated by the rationalist who does not wish to truly know. The rationalist only seeks to acquire that which is useful. The goal of the rationalist is therefore to obtain a purchase on truth, so called. Mu, the root of all mythology, leads us to every consideration of knowledge and utterance. To muse on something is to remember. The Greek myth of the muses developed from the much older Moirae called the Norns in Norse mythology. The Moirae are personified as three women that spin, weave and cut the thread of life. This mystery is accomplished by the power of ordinance, called Moira by the Greeks, and known as Ma'at, or Mut, to the ancient Egyptians. When the immutable is known, reason becomes mute. No value is afforded to divine apostasia, however, in modern culture. For one thing, no purchase can be made upon it, and therefore no profit made. Music can at least entertain, and there we have our muse and our mu, reminding us of something we have forgotten. Professional muses or musicians can be paid for their work, but they cannot be rewarded if they should fall silent. The absolute assumes many guises when it wishes to communicate with the human mind. God, as such, is polymorphic in expression. Temples to Egyptian gods were built in Phoenicia, while the oldest of the Phoenician deities, Esherah, was worshipped in Egypt as Kuchu, or Kutesh, the Holy One. The name of Esherah was later merged with similar-sounding goddesses such as Ashtaroth, Astarte, and Ishtar. She is the type of the scarlet woman as termed in the Egyptian Book of the Law. She is the woman of blood, the soul in her earthly and heavenly or divine aspects. We need to employ reversed psychology to understand much that has been framed in the terms of monotheistic cults. Our Lady of Heaven is a harlot insofar as she is the giver and receiver of all life, she is thus the embodiment of the Holy Grail. 
called Babylon in Thelemic literature, as well as the Enochian calls of Elizabethan mage John Dee, the Scarlet Woman is identified with the temples of the goddess who was adored from Egypt to Babylonia. She thus symbolises everything despised by the zealous scribes, priestly officials, patriarchs, and indeed modern-day scientism, which is absolutely opposed to the very existence of the soul. We have but one word for the soul in the English language, whereas Egyptian and Eastern metaphysics has many terms for the different vehicles or subtle bodies. Fortunately, Lieber L. has given us a simple and practical metaphysics. The scarlet woman of the book is the soul. Left to her natural course, she is a vampire seeking vital sustenance from her environment. Only by undergoing resurrection through the agency of the mysterious serpent Hadith can she overcome the forces of time and death to become an immortal star in the body of Nuit, a cabs in a coup, as we have mentioned earlier. Hadith, the serpent of knowledge, is the ubiquitous metaphysical point of consciousness within the circle of the absolute and is simultaneously everywhere. The Kab star is the fivefold window or gateway of consciousness that projects the visible world or material universe through the five senses in man. Hadith is then the invisible yet active light, the mysterious source behind it. Nuit, the polar complement of Hadith, the circle that encompasses all, can be conceived as zero. The appearance of Nuit via the mysterious agency of Hadith may be likened to the Ku, the magical spirit body formed by the emanations of the Kabs. As according to the Song of the Steely, in chapter 3 of Liber L, Open the ways of the Ku, lighten the ways of the Ka, the ways of the Kabs run through, to stir me or still me. Om, let it fill me. The Ka referred to in Liber L 337 is the vital body encompassing the desire principle. The Ka in the natural state is comparable with the Kabbalistic Nefesh, animal soul or living thing. It is the soul, the self, the life, the creature, the person, including the appetites and passions. Nefesh also means to take breath and is a word used for soul, though it more particularly refers to the soul of nature. The breath taken in by the soul is the wind, scent, fragrance or spirit hidden in creation and giving it life. In the Eastern tradition, this breath animating the soul is called prana, which is manifested in time by the kalas, emanations or moments. The kaibet, shade or shadow, is not mentioned directly in Liber L, but is integral to the function of the ka. The kaibet is more than the shadow of Jungian psychology. It can be imagined as existing on the threshold of matter, all that appears to the five senses of man, and the etheric web that, while being invisible to the ordinary senses, binds all together in a subtle field, a network of threads or fibres. If there is radiance or illumination, the caps and ku, then there must be shadow, the inverse of the light. The range of the kaibet may include the physical body or shell. The physical body is likened to a tent for a nomad, for it is a temporary dwelling place. There is a tug of war that commences once the occult force begins its ascent, awakening each vehicle in turn. The division wrought in the soul has its analogy with the spiritual war, the war in heaven described in mystic literature. 
Ultimately, the Kaibet shell must be cracked apart. The fallen soul or scarlet woman is torn upon wheels or chakras. So the dual principles of soul and lunar can be released for the great work of transmutation upon the soul. According to L371, Hail ye twin warriors about the pillars of the world, for your time is nigh at hand. The Ka is divorced or liberated from the shell of the Kaibet or shadow through theurgy. The Ka is vitality, the life force itself. By magic, its natural hunger is redirected to the spiritual purpose. If not, then the Ka becomes subject to fatal forces. An appetite for spiritual knowledge can be encouraged and developed through the work. If the person has no real appetite for spiritual knowledge, they simply fail in the work. If they merely have a desire for the acquisition and use of knowledge, if they wish to gain a purchase on knowledge, they fail in what is called the second crossing. Will he not sink? Om ho! Warrior, if thy servant sink. L151 This verse was delivered directly to Crowley, who certainly wished to gain a purchase on knowledge. The car, with all its desires and appetites, strongly moved by lunar magnetism, is the scarlet woman or soul in the underworld. She must overcome the hostile forces of the underworld if she is to survive physical mortality. It should not be supposed that the underworld is something only created through belief, or that it is a myth having no root in the so-called real world. Neither is it a place or location that is somehow removed entirely from the physical world. The demonic forces of the underworld dominate human nature. The human soul, nefesh or ka, is the vehicle by which they seek expression in the world. Pistis Sophia is a Coptic manuscript discovered in 1773. The Codex was purchased by the British Museum in 1785 from Anthony Askew. The master of Pistis Sophia found five words concealed in the robe that was prepared for him and declared to the disciples... Zoma, Zoma, Oza, Rakama, Ozaya. This may be interpreted thought, imagination, the sacrament of love and truth. The word that translates as thought is Zoma, which has a wide range of meanings, including desire, meditation, imagination, and sin. A thought comes about through the polarity of the cabs and coup, which may be likened to Kabbalistic Chokmah and Bainar. The coup is the matrix by which the will is formulated. All astral forms are created by will, desire and imagining. The power of thought and the power of imagination are closely linked, as expressed in the single word Zoma. On the higher arc, the seamless robe of the Ku is the matrix by which the intelligent will force builds forms. In magical practice, the will is directed to incarnate through the power of imagining into talismans. Ultimately, the magician is such a talisman, woven from the stuff of dreams, yet charged with a noble purpose, which is the deliverance of love. The astrosum is a summation of all that has an autonomous function on what is called the astral plane in occultism. The word astrosum combines two Greek words, astron, a star, indicating the starry or celestial field, and soma, meaning a body. Magical practice requires working to develop the astrosum so the practitioner can operate fully on the subtle non-material planes. There is a close correspondence between the astrosum and what is referred to as the body of light, although the latter is used more specifically to refer to a mental construct projected by will, 
desire and imagination in magical and yogic practice. The astrosome describes everything other than the physical body or shell. Through magic and yoga, the ka is given the breath of spirit via the higher intellectual faculty afforded through the agency of the ku. Training of the mind is required so the mind becomes a better vehicle for the spiritual intuition beyond the abyss of the human mind. When the solar and lunar forces, symbolized as twin serpents, are stilled by meditation, they no longer pull the mind and emotions this way and that. Hadit, who manifests in the human sphere as the serpent power or occult force, is then able to effect a great work upon the soul. That brings episode 6 to a close. The piece of music I played on the guitar is Prelude in E Major, composed by Francisco Tariga. Thank you for your attention. Love is the law. Love under will. Thank mm-hmm. you.